So, Lance is next. Song cue. Okay, so we can now move away from my bitching and move on to Lance's fight. The battle starts off with Blaine and Mewtwo fighting against Lance. However, due to the Mewtwo cancer, Blaine and Mewtwo are only able to fight for three minutes. So, the fight basically looks like this. Lance bitch slaps Mewtwo. I just can't stop drawing parallels between Lance and Ganondorf. I don't know what it is. The planning, the evil laughter, the red hair, the fashion sense, the ability to survive things that would kill a normal human? Are they related? Does Legend of Zelda take place in the same universe as Pokemon and Metroid as well? You know, maybe that Viridian Trainer stuff is bullshit, and it's actually just the Triforce. Since we've only actually seen three Viridian Trainers. So Lance has the Triforce of Power, Yellow has the Triforce of Courage, and that leaves Giovanni with the Triforce of Wisdom. Ganondorf, is there nothing you can't do and it wouldn't be awesome? Child abuse? Genocide? Oh, and also after the Ruby Sapphire, Pokemon Adventures also takes place in a split timeline. I am not making that up. Getting back on track, it almost looks like Lance has been weakened as Mewtwo transforms his spoon into a spork and breaks the Pokeballs. However, Lance reveals that it was all part of his plan, and that his Pokemon were never in the Pokeballs. Then he reveals his Pokemon, Dragonair, Dragonite, Gyarados, Aerodactyl, the Dragon Force. <laughs> Yeah, I apologize for that joke and only being able to play on easy in Guitar Hero. Thankfully, they don't have a giant cop-out and make the past three volumes entirely pointless. If you want to know how that feels, wait until the Ruby Sapphire arc. If that's too far away, read Naruto volumes 45 to 48. Lance reveals that he is also a Viridian trainer and has all of Yellow's powers, and then he proceeds to heal his wounded Pokémon. In addition to the Viridian Force powers, Yellow also has to deal with Lance's four extra powers. The first, to use his dragons to fly through the air, which ultimately is just cosmetic, since he doesn't actually seem to use the third dimension to dodge. And, in an ironic twist, this leaves him open for more attacks as he forgets to actually defend underneath him. The second ability is to change the direction of Hyper Beam. I guess this could be used to surprise opponents and strike them in any blind spots. However, this ability is wasted on Lance because every time he uses it, he only attacks head-on. The third is to control the weather, which is another cosmetic power. It was also only used during their encounter at Vermilion City. Apparently, he didn't think of using a gust of wind to knock Yellow or her Pokémon into lava. And the fourth and final ability is the greatest one of all, one that no mere mortal can even grasp. Lance's final special ability is to multitask and combine them together! <laughs> No, seriously, they list that as a special power. Wouldn't that just be basic strategy? But what the hell do I know? I'm just a college dropout. The fate of the world lies on Yellow's shoulders. Of course, you already know the conclusion, since there are currently 30 more volumes to go, and the series is still being written. And Pokémon is such a happy and optimistic series that there would never be a downer ending. Well, certainly this manga won't have a downer ending. Crap. I don't want to ruin this battle. This just isn't a battle between Pokémon, it is also a battle of ideals. While rereading through this series again, more specifically volumes 3 through 7, I was wondering what would have happened if Red didn't rescue Yellow back then? If she lived, would she have become bitter towards how Team Rocket treated Pokémon? Would she have turned out like a member of the Elite Four? And it is here where you realize how much of an impact Red had on Yellow. It is Red and Yellow's ideal that Pokémon are companions, and throughout the series it becomes a reoccurring theme of what do Pokémon mean to various characters. The answers vary from comrades, friends, partners, to the rather dark answer of weapons. Lance believes that Pokémon shouldn't have to listen to humans and that humans have led to countless Pokémon suffering. Yellow knows this isn't the right way. During her journey, she has seen what Pokémon have been enduring, and she believes that there must be a better solution than killing all humans. The only thing that Lance's path will bring is death and destruction. Or, as Viz's translation puts it, pain and destruction. Viz. Here is a pro tip. When censoring something, please take five seconds of your incredibly busy schedule to make sure that the same scene isn't available uncensored in a book that you still sell in stores under the exact same age rating. Of course, there are a few things I would like to point out. Besides Lance's sanity, I do have to question his eyesight. On one page, he says that not even one of Yellow's Pokémon have evolved. One clearly on that page is Eradicate, or is there a new evolution that will be revealed in a future generation? So until that time where Eradicate evolves, Lance just looks like a dumbass right now. He also needs to join Professor Oak and book an appointment at the Automatrist. 
because Radita and Radicate are two completely different sizes and colors. At one point, Lance falls into lava. He survives by using a bubble. Professor Link will now demonstrate what happens to normal people when they fall in lava. <laughs> Perhaps the biggest problem in this fight, ignoring Viz's idiotic and consistent censorship, is that they just treat lava as hot boiling water. Apparently, Viridian trainers are much stronger than Chozo-infused superhumans, and don't need authorization from Adam to activate their various suits. Link an encore, please. <laughs> Also, Bubbles have the ability to break bones. And I really have to hand it to Yellow. Even after her arm is broken, she continues to battle. At this point, I probably would be crying on the ground like a little bitch, just like I was at the end of Mother 3 and the Ruby Sapphire arc. And don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. But she just shrugs it off like it happens to her every day. And despite the level disadvantage, Yellow does come up with some rather creative ways to deal with Lance. She's able to think on her feet and improvise. She certainly has difficulty, and a third Viridian trainer has to step in to help Yellow, but that was to be expected. Next to nothing has changed between Yellow and Lance's first encounter at Vermilion City. She is fighting against a Viridian trainer who has at least had 10 more years of experience than her. The only power boost she has is when her Pokémon evolve towards the end of the fight. Strangely, this includes the Graveler that was given to her back in Volume 4. It's acknowledged in the text that much like the games, it is only supposed to evolve through a trade. My question is, why didn't it evolve when Brock gave it to her? Or does that not count as a trade since he didn't get a Pokemon in return? In the round called The Might of Ellipses Metapod, Yellow uses her Metapod as a shield to block a Hyper Beam. Remember, this was the same attack that vaporized Vermilion City. Metapod is also apparently so powerful it is able to absorb all the recoil, stop Yellow's other arm from breaking, stop the explosion from engulfing Yellow, stopping all of the heat and energy being released from the explosion from hurting Yellow, stopping Yellow from suffering hearing damage from being so close to an explosion, defying the laws of physics and stopping Yellow from going flying in the other direction, and when that cast does come off, her arm is fully healed, and it enables Yellow to use the final attack. Crap! Maybe that Caterpie did create Arceus. And with all this power that Yellow has at her fingertips, all she uses Butterfree for is wings to fly! Weak. Although this does lead me to wonder, who would win in a fight? Godzilla or Yellow's Butterfree? Fanfiction.net, don't let me down now! The battle is won through the power of friendship. Yellow and Pikachu receive the power of Megavolt, an attack with 10 times the strength of Thunderbolt. So, since Thunderbolt is called 100,000 volts in Japanese, that would be 1 million volts of electricity. So, after being hit by more than 1 million volts of electricity, Lance is defeated and we find out later he somehow lived. I guess being related to Ganondorf and holding the Triforce of Power does save you from certain death. Giovanni meets up with Lieutenant Surge and Sabrina. Koga isn't there due to trying to find the nearest hospital so he can get a blood transfusion. Or the embarrassment of either trying to poison a Poison-type Pokémon, or because of the embarrassment of his sex change operation and dressing up as a teenage girl over the past two years. Giovanni does what any completely rational person who runs a crime syndicate that has lost all of its members and currently only includes himself would do. He tells the other two who would happily join Team Rocket again to piss off, and be ashamed that they had to work together with kids, and that neither of them would be able to counter the power of Megavolt. Lieutenant Surge, despite running an electric-type gym, doesn't suggest ground types. I'm going to assume that these two were so shocked over being fired that they can only stand there and take verbal abuse. That being said, here is my convoluted plan for defeating Megavolt. Or, Giovanni could take advantage of their weakened state and kill them all right now. How did he run a crime syndicate again? Because I'm pretty sure he didn't get funding for Team Rocket by working at Tim Hortons or selling Girl Guide cookies. There is a rather poignant dream sequence. Strangely, it is kept in Viz's translation as it ends on the note of mortality. Things don't last forever. Yellow knew that one day Pikachu would have to return to Red. Her hidden desires are also shown. Her Pokémon revert back to their pre-evolved state, being a metaphor of not wanting to grow up. And I'm reading too much into this. Upon awakening from her dream, she is on the back of Red Gyarados, and our heroes just sort of ride off into the sunrise. They note that Red is the only one who doesn't know that Yellow is a girl, and it will be eight more volumes until he actually finds that out. Supposedly, Yellow also goes to see a doctor for that broken arm of hers. 
Then there is an epilogue quickly saying what happens to various characters and setting up for Volume 8 with this picture, which I'm sure you're sick of me showing you. So that's Volumes 1 through 7 of Pokemon Adventures, and that took far too long. Now that I've finished that, I still don't know why I like this manga. Let's be honest here, this is a kid's manga. I'm probably not supposed to overanalyze every little action and apply common sense to it. It's a lot more enjoyable if you just blitz through it. The story arc started off strongly. We are led to believe that a single member of an evil group was able to curb stomp the previous protagonist, and send Pikachu back half-dead. Within 20 pages, it's established that the villains of this story arc is a force to be reckoned with. Unfortunately, the Elite Four get screen time, and actions speak louder than words. They come across as incompetent and not fully committed to their goals. The only one who appears remotely serious about their overall goal is Agatha, and maybe that's just because she actually almost killed two people. Of course, that's quickly negated in her fight, as she seems more motivated by revenge, and the reason behind that is rather petty. Although in Agatha's defense, Professor Oak is a giant asshole. Also, she's a coward. Apparently, a utopia for Pokémon isn't worth dying for. At least Lorelai fought until she was knocked unconscious. To me, the Elite Four don't exactly seem threatening. They are just bullies. This situation isn't exactly helped by the censorship. The censorship, at best, is understandable in the case of Pokéball tits. And at worst, it's stupid and inconsistent with everything regarding death. If these things were allowed in the first translation, what changed and stopped them from being allowed in the second translation? Unfortunately for Viz, death is a giant theme in this manga, being the driving motivation behind both and actions. And is anyone else afraid that entire motivation is going to be turned into stopping two Laprases from going into the Shadow Realm? So that's the first two chapters of Pokémon Adventures. Unfortunately, there's one last thing I have to cover, and before I move on to another series, the best of Pokémon Adventures Yellow. You're never gonna take me alive! I'll take you all on! I'll kill you all! You'll never make me do this! Never! Never! Oh fuck, that hurt.